Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host. Over the course of this show, we will learn about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we're honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Deputy Mayor Maggie Horsfield of the City of North Bay in the province of Ontario. Maggie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I am as well. It's always great to talk to someone from my home province of Ontario. And I want to start with the million dollar question that I've asked every single municipal candidate or politician on my show. You're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? That's a great question. Um, you know, I've always been someone who's always gotten involved from a very young age in school politics and student councils and, you know, event planning and just trying to figure out how to make things better for folks. And so it's always been within me to want to give back and help others. And then I ended up staying in North Bay after I graduated high school and went to Nipissing University and studied history and political science. So I started to learn more about different political theories, how debates operate, uh, you know, how decisions are made, how the different levels of government work. And I've always been really passionate uh, about it. And so I started really paying attention to federal government, provincial and municipal. And then in 2018, the last uh, municipal election in North Bay, I thought about running. And, you know, it was at a point where I had been working full time and I had decided I was going to plant my roots and stay in North Bay, but I didn't actually feel fully ready yet. So I decided that from 2018 to 2022, I was going to pay attention to municipal politics and the issues that were coming up and how it operated and how it worked. And, you know, I know that term of council, they had an interesting experience because of COVID. And so what would have probably been normal process uh, really changed through that experience. But I, it actually helped me because I got to watch the virtual meetings from home, you know, while I was making dinner and not having to worry about being on camera. So I got to, you know, pay attention to the, the issues they were talking about. And so then in 2022, I was a part of a provincial campaign to when I had a friend who was running uh, provincially. And I learned a lot more about, you know, door knocking and canvassing and how to uh, market yourself. And I decided, you know what, I think I'm ready. You know, I'm, I'm ready. I want to, you know, do my civil duty and put my name in the ring, see what happens. And so that's when I decided to run. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start <laughs> with this though. I always find it interesting, the story of why you ran, and you just explained a little bit there, but I want to go back to you as a young child, and I want to know, was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because you kind of took the same route that I did. I went to university as well for political studies at Queen's University. I'm not going to hold the fact that you went to Nip Nipissing uh, University against you. Just a slight <laughs> just a call out to my alma mater there. But mm -hmm. for you, growing up, was politics discussed? And when it came to politics, if it was discussed, was it federal politics, municipal politics, or municipal politics, or all three? You know, it actually wasn't really discussed at the dinner table. I probably wow. talked more about politics um, with classmates and with teachers, especially in high school. I think that's really where I found my footing. And I had a teacher in high school that really had a big impact on allowing me to feel empowered to uh, debate and challenge um, other schools of thought and other people in the class who maybe did have families that were more well-versed in political discussions and, you know, really encouraged me to, you know, you have a voice too. You should share your opinion and you don't have to agree and you can defend yourself and you have the evidence, um, you know, speak up. So you just you you contemplate running in 2018 and you ultimately decide to pass on that. I want to know what was the 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 final nail in the coffin that said to yourself, okay, 
this is the election I'm running in. 2022 is the election that I'm getting involved in. Was there a local issue that's going on in the community or was it you finally just saying, okay, I think I have a little bit more experience. I have my roots in my community and what I'm seeing post COVID and we can, we can debate COVID and what happened there if we want to, but let's not, let's talk about you. Let's, (laughs) what was the final nail that finally said, okay, 2018, I wasn't ready, but 2022, I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's pull the trigger. What was that moment for you? Yeah, no, great question. I think it was a couple of factors. When I looked at who was on city council and, you know, who I felt represented me, there was really one person of the 10 of counselors that we have. Uh, There's also a mayor. And, you know, I would sent emails. I had concerns about community safety and speeding. And uh, there was a fence put in that, you know, disrupted a trail system um, because it crossed private property. And it was interesting to see who actually responded to the email, even if it was just to acknowledge, you know, thank you for your email. I hear you, you know, please know it's been received versus how many didn't even acknowledge that I was reaching out. And so there was a town hall where anyone could, you know, schedule to do a five minute presentation to council on anything they wanted. Council could ask questions. And so I'm like, you know what, I'm going to, you know, I was really concerned about speeding because my husband and I had just bought a, a house and it's a 40 kilometer an hour school zone and no one really treats it as such. <laughs> so not, like, you know, not unique here. to just North, North Bay. And that's an issue a lot of places, it sounds like. Exactly. And that's what I've learned, too, is there's a lot of issues that as much as, you know, people think it's unique to their community, it is not. Um, but I did the presentation and I realized, you know what? I kind of think I want to throw my name in because there's other people that reached out to me from that presentation and said, I feel the same about my street. I've been trying to you know, get this advocacy out there too. We should coordinate. And I'm going, you know, I think this might be it. Um, Maybe this is where I'm meant to be to try and help initiate that change, find solutions and really drive action. So you get to the election period and in Ontario, it's a very unique election period. I think they changed it this election where it's a shorter period, but it's still a long time and there's a lot of lead up to it. You seem to have a pulse on the community. You seem to be engaged. You took four years and you learned about the issues. You sort of got involved. You ran the, you helped on the provincial campaign. But going out there and door knocking yourself is a completely different entity than being the campaign helper. When you were door knocking in North Bay in that election, what were the issues Were they more micro issues, like local independent issues, like potholes, street repairs, infrastructure upgrades, or were they more macro issues, education, healthcare, uh, provincial fundings? What was some of the uh, issues that you were hearing? And were you taken back by some of the issues? Because you can prepare as much as you want, but until you get to every single door, you're going to hear different things from different people. Oh, yeah. I think that was probably the most telling experience was door knocking. Um, You know, at first it was, I didn't know what to expect because it's much different when you're door knocking on someone else's behalf, you know, especially when it's party politics and there's a platform and it's, you know, the messaging is very concise. This was my opportunity to introduce myself to people, um, you know, and sell them on who I am. And then also ask them, you know, yeah, what's important to you? And I would say the number one thing I heard was, you know, how are you going to help the homeless and figure out housing? Um, Again, not a unique problem to North Bay, but it's something that has been exacerbated over, you know, the past decade. Um, Just, you know, we went from being a community where I grew up to, I knew that I think there was one person uh, at one time that was uh, experiencing homelessness to now hundreds. And, It wasn't necessarily how are you going to get rid of them, but what are you actually going to do for them? What are you going to do to change that? And so, you know, that really took me back home to look into how is the federal government involved in the solutions? How is the provincial government involved in solutions? And why are people asking the municipal leaders, what are you going to do? 
about it. So that I, no, I, I want to jump in on that statement there for a second, because I find it fascinating because I always talk about apathy on this show when it deals with municipal governments. And I want to know from you, because you just hit it on the nail, head on the hammer on the nail there. And I want to just jump into it a little bit more. The issues that you were approached with and are approached with now, are they more federal and provincial issues and people are looking for the municipality and even yourself as deputy mayor and a member of council to try and help solve? Because let's be honest, provincial and federal governments are in Ottawa, in Toronto, and you're there locally in your community 24-7. How do you balance that and how do you sort of not deflect but say to the people this is not just a north bay issue this is a ontario issue this is a canada issue and we need everyone to come to the table it's been an interesting balance um, <laughs> you know i do definitely get those emails about my street has potholes it hasn't been plowed um you know i want a sidewalk uh that type of thing as well so that you know those you know the issues that are more municipally owned definitely come up but I uh it's also a challenge in North Bay is that we don't operate in the city with social services it's a district model so as much as other municipalities you know people will turn and look at Toronto and they'll look at um other communities and go well their municipality does talk about housing and homelessness as part of their mandate how come it's not yours and it's it is but we actually have a separate board and a separate administrative group who is responsible not only for North Bay, but for a catchment area that extends uh, 200 kilometers in some directions. Uh, so we also have to think of rural and the urban inflow to North Bay because we have the services. Um, and I went to a conference back in January in Toronto. It was called Roma, which is the Rural Ontario Municipal Association. And, you know, all the topics at that conference were pretty much um, mostly provincial, a lot of federal topics such as housing, homelessness, um, you know, asset management plans that was legislated by the province. And so when I answer people's emails, you know, I, sh I have to figure out how to show that I do care and am still compassionate and do want to make sure that we are helping those who are unhoused but at the same time, how do I also point them in the direction of, please also send an email to our local MP and MPP to let them know that um, this is what you're seeing and you're experiencing. So it's it's been an interesting balance. And there's been a lot of resolutions and motions that we've put forward in the past six months that I've been on council that are very much um, almost like letter writing campaigns to the other levels of government to say, our council as a whole, this is what we're seeing in our community. Um, this is what we want to change. This is where we see your levels of government coming in, playing their role in solving these challenges too. I'm going to just play a little devil's advocate with you here for a yes. second. So you, you're writing these letters to your provincial and your federal counterparts. Um, are you being heard? Are you tracking who's actually responding to you like you did in 2021 when you were preparing to potentially <laughs> run for 2022 and saying, who's actually paying attention? Who's responding to me? And who's actually taking this issue seriously? Yeah, no. And I think luckily in North Bay, we have a great relationship with both our MP and MPP. Our uh, MP is actually the House Speaker for uh, the House Commons in Ottawa. Anthony Rada. Um, so Yes, so he's got a good pulse on North Bay, and um, then our MPP is Vic Fidelli, and he used to be the mayor of North yeah. Bay for, I believe it was two terms back early in the 2000s. And so, you know, they do come home at the end of the day or on the weekends, and North Bay is, or in the surrounding areas where they are. So they, they see it and they hear it too. And I do think we actually had some, a really great funding announcement from the province a couple of weeks ago where they, uh, I believe it was close to $5 million to help us with our um, transitional low barrier shelter and housing and maintaining that operating dollars because otherwise it was going to be falling on the tax levy on the district to cover the costs. 
And they recognized through our delegations and through our communications and, you know, they do acknowledge that they're hearing us loud and clear and doing what they can to help with that pot of money that everyone and every community is trying to get their hands into. I want to go back to you for a second, because we're going to be talking about North Bay in a few seconds here, but I want to go back to you. Mm. You, you, you've been on both sides of that council table. You've been presenting to council and now you're a people, you're a person who has presentations delivered to you from public. Uh, You're relatively new into your term. Is it what you expect it? Is it, is the job what you expect it? And what is the biggest learning experience that you've had on the job so far? Because you're not alone in BC, Manitoba, mm-hmm. Ontario, New Brunswick, a lot of new counselors. So what did you, what was the biggest learning curve for you? It's yeah, I feel like the past six months has been just a learning experience and also trial by fire because, you know, it, it doesn't start now. It's been, it started back in November, but Uh, With our council, we actually had six of the 10 new, never been on council before. And the mayor, um, this is his first term as mayor. He had previously been on council. So he luckily had um, some, you know, experience with the council, but there was a majority of us that were new. So the the city staff and the other councillors that had been on uh, council for a number of terms before really did help kind of slow things down a little bit and take that extra time. We had a lot of education sessions to walk through, you know, what is the official plan? What are tax rates? Um, you know, all those details, whereas, you know, a council that might be majority, you know, serving on their next term could probably kind of jump in a bit quicker. Um, and I think the biggest learning curve is, uh, you know, my day job, I work at the university and I assist with the Board of Governors. So I have an understanding of governance um, for public institution in the public realm. But even municipal government being, you know, it's different. It's its own beast. And, you know, reading the Municipal Act, being very familiar with what is the jurisdiction and what are the roles of council and what are the roles of staff and, you know, where is crossing the line? Um, you know, you can't go out and tell the public works workers how and where to um, fix the potholes because that's what you want to see. You know, you can let them know that you've seen it, but at the end of the day, there's staff and council sets the direction. Um, yeah, so it's been, you know, learning where we fit in as a council and as counselors where we can have the biggest impact and then how we can, you know, give that direction, set the policy, set the plans to have the staff execute it. Now I I told you that I usually don't tell people the, like the topics or the questions I'm going to ask, but we had talked about this in our pre-interview. You run for council expecting to be a counselor, but you run for council and you get the most votes and ultimately yeah. you become deputy mayor. Um, this is like a, a, like a win-win for anyone who's running for council. But for you, when you decided to run, were you even considering like getting the top votes and potentially becoming deputy mayor? Because explain how that works in the city of North, uh, North Bay. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was interesting. You know, I knew that I really wanted to be on council. And so I knew how many votes in the past people typically would get to make it in the top 10 because we don't have a ward system. It's based on um, the top 10 people getting the highest amount of votes and that's your council. And so, you know, I engaged during my campaign, a lot of social media and attending events and that door knocking and really tried to go from all the different angles with some radio ads, with all the different audiences. And so, you know, I went into election night with a good feeling, but also was being very humble. And, you know, it's my first time running. Um, Horsefield is actually my married name and I had just changed it a year ahead of time. So, you know, North Bay is said to be a city that really goes on your name and name recognition. So I wasn't sure if I was, if I had shot myself in the foot by not running with my maiden name. So I, you know, I kind of put in those factors of, you know, still be, you know, don't be too certain you're making it on, but let's see what happens. 
And then on election night, seeing my name as the polls come in, climb to the top, it was kind of a, you know, a shock and the reality set in. Um, but then I saw the other names that you know, I guess came behind me, um, as well as the mayor. And I thought, you know what? I feel it's not just me. Uh, I'm going to be supported. I'm going to be there for them as well. We're a team. Uh, we can make this happen. But the first month, I think, after the election, whenever someone called me deputy mayor Horsfield or asked me about it, I would kind of giggle um, and just be like, oh, gosh, that, that's me. Right. Did you okay. know? Did yes. you know on election night that you'd be named deputy mayor? Like, I'm assuming you've read policies and all that. But was that something that you went, oh, God, I've just been elected. And oh, no, I've just been elected deputy mayor. Of the city <laughs> yeah. As well. yeah, it was kind of like, <laughs> OK. Yeah, I knew this, I knew it would be a big shift to be on council, but this is a bit more, but you know what, let's do it. Um, and so, yeah, you know, immediately having the uh, media surround me and say, so you're deputy mayor, how do you feel? What are your plans? What are you going to do? It's like, well, first, let me just absorb it. It's going to take a little while still, but you know, it's like, let's do it kind of thing. You know, I'm not one to shy away from a challenge and so as much as it was kind of like, whoa, all right, this is this is this is what it is. I was also very excited to be like, you know what? That's that's actually really cool too. Like that many people um, felt comfortable enough to put a, a mark beside my name. Like if they if this many people feel that I can do it, I can do it. That's awesome. I want to yeah. ask one last question before we turn to the next segment, and it's about the responsibility of your job. You have to go into that council meeting and make decisions that are going to impact people the most, and they are going to impact their budget, their properties, their garbage pickup, their water bills, you name it, it's going to impact them. Even if it's a small policy, whether it be service fees increasing through uh, at your local field uh, uh, house or your arena, they impact the most, particularly at the municipal level. How much weight do you put on yourself to be prepared every time you walk into that council chambers, but not be cemented in how you're going to vote because you're open to hearing from delegations like you were one and from fellow councillors who may have different opinions who you might think to yourself, say, hmm, that's an interesting way to think of it. I didn't think of it that way. And now I'm going to change my vote. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself going into that um, those meetings every time? Yeah, it's uh, already in the first six months, we've had to make some pretty big decisions. Um, you know, some decisions that were very split as well. And it is a lot of weight. And I do recognize that because you know, I don't want to just go in there thinking about myself. Um, you know, I, I have to try and think about all those other individuals that are impacted on the bottom line and hear from them too. So what I've been trying to do is when we get the council agenda, reaching out on my networks and saying, here's what's on the agenda. Here's my email, you know, or send me a direct message and let's chat. You know, if you're, if you're concerned about this, I want to hear it. Um, and so even from the people that support it too, I want to hear why, because it can be on there, but if we're just getting a recommendation from staff, I also want to hear from those at the end of the day that it's going to impact. And do you go actually, outside as... your echo chamber. I apologize to interrupt, but do you go outside oh, yeah, your no. social media? Because I always find it fascinating when politicians like yourself, and I'm not saying you've just said it, but will say, I go mm -hmm. out and talk to people. Is it just social media and you post it on Twitter and Facebook? Or will you go actually to the local coffee shop and sit down and say, tell me your issues, people? Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I recognize that those echo chambers exist and- <laughs> You know, even though if you have that core group of people that you like to run things by, that they also probably think like me um, or see the world the way I do. So it's important to also think about the people that see it differently. Um, so I do try and reach out to those individuals. If, you know, someone stops me on the street or at the grocery store or at the hockey game, uh, you know, hearing them out because their opinion matters too. Um, on Monday night, I actually spoke to a group of Spark Ember Girl Guide Pathfinders. Um, so very range age as well, but then also their 
uh, troop leaders. And it was interesting because, you know, I actually almost got grilled a bit more by <laughs> um, the 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 ladies around the table being like, well, what about this? And what about that? And, you know, they said, you know what, like, you actually handled that really well. You were positive and you, but you weren't deflective. You weren't trying to like, you were, yeah, I hear you. Okay. Thank you. And so I was like, okay, that's, that's good feedback too. And so I do try and seek out those dissenting voices possibly, or those that might see the world differently. Um, because yeah, otherwise I'm just going to be sitting in my house, you know, and not feel affected. Whereas others may be more affected by decisions. I want yeah. to turn to the city here now as a whole. And mm -hmm. before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it because I like to preface things because people seem to send me really weird emails whenever I don't. This is a conversation <laughs> between the deputy mayor and myself. This is her opinion, not a motion of council, not a policy of council, not a direction of council. This is her opinion. It may line up with council. It may not. I'm not sure because she's about to tell me what her opinion is. So Deputy Mayor Horsfield, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of North Bay as of recording this episode? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a couple things, I would say. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, the housing and helping the um, homeless that has been on the radar for a number of years, exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Um, but even since being on council, you know, North Bay, we get our cold winters and um, we were in the process of creating a permanent shelter, but also that shelter only has limited space. And there's also individuals that don't choose, that choose not to use the shelter. Um, and then it's minus 40 Celsius. And, you know, what can we do? Um, that's, you know, I would say one of the biggest things is how are we helping those individuals and connecting with the other levels of government, but also doing our part too. So um, you've basically our, taken yeah, the ahead. question. You've basically taken the question out of my mouth here, Deputy Mayor. What are you doing? What <laughs> are you as not 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 as council, but what are you doing specifically yourself to help try and move this issue forward? Because you're not alone, and I think mm -hmm. it's always it's always great to hear different perspectives than what other municipalities are doing. I was recently at SUMA, the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association Conference, which is basically Roma, but for Saskatchewan, and I was speaking to municipal councillors, and they say that's an issue that they're facing with as well. So it's always great to hear what other people are doing and other communities are doing. So that way people can sort of work collaboratively and say, what's the best scenario and how can we help people who are uh, experiencing homelessness? So for you as a council, as the deputy mayor, what are you doing to advocate and sort of move this file forward? Yeah, it's, um, I think something I think about weekly, if not daily. And actually this afternoon before filming this, I was at the uh, District of Nipissing Social Service Administration Board, uh, DSAB, which is um, responsible. One of their mandates is for housing and uh, supporting home, the homeless. And so that was one of the things first off that I did was I wanted to get on that board if I could when we were selecting all the different boards and agencies and committees that we were a part of as counselors, um, because I knew that that was where I would be able to find out more about what's been done, what can be done, and where I can fit into it. I've also been spending a lot of time um, meeting with individuals that are unhoused or experiencing different challenges to hear directly from them you know, where are the roadblocks and the barriers and the challenges that you experience? Because, you know, we might think, oh, we have we have a low barrier shelter. You shouldn't be unhoused. But then you find out, oh, well, um, because they might have just gotten out of jail that this is going on or there, you know, if not every story for every individual is the exact same or cookie cutter. Everyone has their own cycle um, some individuals, they've been couch surfing, or there's domestic violence, um, or they, you know, were rent evicted, um, and just trying to figure out where they can get support. Does and North so Bay it's been a lot big shadow population, sorry, a big, 
what type of population? <laughs> shadow population where like you you talk about the couch surfers the ones who mm -hmm. come in and jump from couch to couch to couch and it happens in most communities and they're not technically they're the residents but they're not established residents if that makes sense yeah. so is there a shadow population definitely and it might be it and... might be a it might be a statement that's only unique to alberta because that's where i learned it from was from alberta so yeah i, I, I haven't heard that before but i'm like yeah that's a good way of putting it and that's been one of the challenges and what um, the DSAB and others have been working towards is creating a list of names um, and trying to connect with those individuals, but they they aren't as obvious as those who are on the street. And so to find out, you know, they might have a job, they might have a vehicle, but they just don't have permanent housing and finding out, you know, are they on a rent to geared income um, housing list, you know, do they fit into that category? And, um, you know, North Bay being the um, a municipality surrounded by smaller towns and townships and villages, you know, we do get the influx from other communities because this is kind of the urban center, very much like a Toronto um, or an Ottawa or even Sudbury down the road where, you know, this is where you might have a chance of getting a job or getting permanent housing because there isn't in your community. So I like, you know, as much as we can know, there is quite a large population of people who are just couch surfing, um, the shadow population. Yeah. Does it make it harder? Does it make it harder to try to start figuring out the solution? Because there are so many unique and like you said, non cookie cutter solutions for each uh, subsect of people who are experiencing, whether it be homelessness or couch surfing. And I can imagine as a municipal counselor, you want to help everyone, but you kind of have to pick which ones you're going to have to start with because not every solution is going to work for every single population. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And, you know, even being um, an individual male versus a female uh, that can dictate your housing, um, Families too definitely have different needs, especially when children are involved. Seniors, um, it's just, there is a spectrum. It's not an individual group and it's not just, you know, build units. You know, some just need a bedroom, others need three bedrooms and uh, a kitchen and a living, you know, like the living conditions and job opportunity. And uh, it's just, it's much more, than just building housing. Um, housing is definitely a big part of the solution, but even with food and security, it goes hand in hand with income, um, with housing and that cycle too. While you're relatively new to the role of uh, council and deputy mayor, I, I like posing this question because it gets me into the insight of how you look at the city and look at the individual, because as council, you have to look at the city as a whole. You can't pick the east side or the west side or the northeast side and the southeast side as where things are going to grow more and more uh, uh, better than the others. You have to look at it as the whole issue. But you also have to look at the individual issues, the residential, the residence issues, whether it be that pothole or I need a sidewalk or I need a uh, my street plowed. How do you balance that? How do you see your role of deputy mayor and as a council member of balancing the needs of the individual versus the needs of the growth and the continued expansion of the city? Yeah, um, a challenge. I guess, you know, in one word, it, it's a challenge. Uh, luckily, I've actually lived in the majority of neighborhoods in North Bay. Um, so I have a sense being, you know, having lived here for so long, I, I got a sense of the different areas of town and, you know, how close the park is, you know, when it, you're, I currently live just outside the downtown core um, in North Bay being, you know, an older railroad city. Where I live, there's lots of sidewalks, but then I also know some, there's a lot of new subdivisions that have no sidewalks. Um, but then at the same time, when you add sidewalks, you need to do sidewalk repair and you need to plow the sidewalks. And as you build out, uh, the urban sprawl costs more money. And I think that's one area where 
I see North Bay even just trying to go in a different direction to try and build up, which we haven't always really done before. So instead of trying to build into new neighborhoods, um, there is room for that and there is need for that. But also looking at the housing needs, if we want to keep our young people here, if we want to help seniors and other individuals, you know, downgrade the size of their home and the housing spectrum, not everyone needs a three bedroom, three bathroom house, they might just be looking for uh, an apartment or a condo. And so we as a council have uh, a growth community improvement plan that was brought forward by a previous council. Uh, and it's really something that we're focusing on is how can we create more urban densification? And instead of continuing to put the burden on adding more and more assets, because if we can uh, be more dense, then we can focus on those neighborhoods that are looking and have more uh, niche concerns or want that extra sidewalk because we're not adding more sidewalks to newer subdivisions, but taking care of what we already have. Um, so it's kind of a balance of, you know, growing the city, uh, which I know a lot of municipalities, municipalities are also trying to do, creating housing, uh, using the assets we already have, and then supporting the people that are here so that they can get those uh, niche or requests for their neighborhood um, that they might see in another neighborhood. Is it hard to say no in your job? Because I can imagine you get emails from people saying, I want a new arena. I want a new pool. I want this, <laughs> that, or the other. I want a better park in my area. I want sidewalks. And at the end of the day, you know, and I know that municipalities can't run deficits. You cannot run a deficit as much as you think you, uh, people think they can, you can't. So you yeah. have to sort of say, no, we can't look at it this year because we have other projects going on, but come to, to us next year or the year after, and we'd love to sit down and chat with you. But right now it's just not fiscally possible to help in that scenario where you're looking at potentially wanting a park or a sidewalk or a a pool. And I, and I, I said that and you laughed. I'm assuming you've probably heard that a few times then. <laughs> and you know, it's really actually quite funny because, um, as deputy mayor, I'm also budget chief as I'm chair of general government. And so not only was I thrown into being deputy mayor, but I also was, you know, the chief lead on getting all the council on board with, um, the budget. And this year we really got to see, you know, the impact even of how chemical costs have gone up and we need to have a water treatment center <laughs> and we need the same amount of chemicals, but it's costing more. Um, but at the same time, it'd be really great. We have, we could probably, it'd be lovely to build more parks and more trails and more sidewalks, but then there's the priorities of just even operating the city as it currently is. And then when you mentioned the arena, um, you know, if you want to do a quick Google search on North Bay Arena, that is um, such a, a big thing right now. Our arenas in North Bay are very old. Um, there's some that are wood framed and, you know, we're basically counting down the days to see when that arena is going to collapse on itself. Um, but at the same time, we need to build a new one. And the folks in town are have a lot of opinion. There's people that understand and agree with the current design and where the plan is going. And then there's also a large number of people that disagree. Um, and so that's been an interesting navigation, especially for the first six months um, of a quite new council is, you know, the needs of our community, the needs of uh, individuals, and the cost of things and where we're putting those dollars. Um, because yeah, we have, you know, our city does have reserves, we built them up, but you can spend them quite quickly um, if you say yes to everything. And so there's that balance of, okay, is this a need today? Where does this fit in our 10 year capital plan? Is there government grants and government funding that we could tap into if we have a proposal ready to go? Um, and just finding ways to find that balance, that's, that's the challenge. 
Um, I appreciate you taking time and answering that question. I want to turn to <laughs> segment three, and this is the final segment because I just realized we're at 40 minutes and I did not realize it was been 40 minutes already. This is the great thing about the show. Time yeah. flies when you're having fun. I, I like talking about tourism because I'm a tourist. Mm. And this summer, uh, my husband and I are driving from Calgary back to my hometown of Newcastle, Ontario, and we're going to be stopping in North Bay. We're going to make oh. a special trip to stop in North Bay yes. and see some of these tourist destinations you're about to explain to me and my listeners and my oh, viewers. Oh, good. So, Deputy Mayor Maggie, what are the hidden gems of the tourist industry that people need to see if they're in North Bay? Well, for one, you're going to let me know when you're in North Bay so I can take you out to some of these places, please. Yes. Um, but North Bay, you know, we're this balance of outdoors. Our waterfront is absolutely stunning. It actually used to be all railroad um, because we were a railroad community and they built it right along the shores of Lake Nipissing. And so when that changed, um, we actually, as a community, took it back. And since 1996, there's been a group of community volunteers that maintain the gardens. And so they're just absolutely spectacular. The waterfront is stunning. Um, you know, it kind of, when people are considering moving to North Bay, we try and get them to come up in the summer uh, and take them down there. There's carousels and a mini train. Uh, the old CPR building is the North Bay Museum. And it has you know, rotating um, exhibits. And then also in the summertime, there's the Dion Quince Museum, which if you're familiar with the Dion Quince story, uh, kind of put North Bay and our area on the map. Uh, so that's always a really neat place to check out because it's the original homestead where they were born. Um, oh, and it's been wow. relocated into North Bay. Yeah, so the house is still there and that is inter an interesting attraction. Our main street is also really cool because it's very much um, kept its original look and feel. And there's a lot of um, individually owned businesses down there, uh, really neat businesses that are fun to check out. There's an antique store that was a shoe store that's been there since 1947, I believe, or even earlier. It may be, no, it's way earlier, but it's been owned by the same individual since 1947. And sometimes he's there. So if you want to know the history of North Bay, you go in Ralph is uh, in the shop too. And that's always fun. My husband, whenever we go downtown, he's like, we have to go to Deegan's. We have to go to Deegan's Antiques. And it's like, you just go into this room and then it goes into another room. And then you go upstairs into another room and then to another room. And there's, you know, you're going to go home with your bags full of very You're interesting making me miss souvenirs. Ontario right now. You are so <laughs> making me miss Ontario right now because I loved antiquing as with my family as a younger uh, kid. And I, oh, give, oh. Well, there you go. We'll, we'll put it on your stop. Um, <laughs> and then also North Bay has a lot of trails uh, and not, you know, not mountainous trails. We do have some that are hilly because we're on an escarpment as well. But right in the middle of the city is the Laurier Woods Conservation Area. And so part of when the industrial area of North Bay expanded, there was an area that was created to offset the wetlands because we are also a little bit swampy in some spots. Um, right in between, because we're between two watersheds and two lakes, North Bay kind of falls in there. The Laurier Woods, you can see all the wildlife. It's you know, one of my favorite places to go for a walk um, or a hike and just to to see that. And it's also community run. They put in boardwalks and info areas on the different species that you see there. Um, so there's just, it's a really neat balance of enjoying the outdoors, being close to two lakes. We have dozens and dozens of public beaches and public access points. Uh, so if you come and it's not raining and the weather's nice, you know, you can go for a dip pretty much anywhere. So yeah, I love North Bay. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, but I, to, to get even more local mm -hmm. after a long day with, for you, after a stressful day at council, after a long day at work, where in the community do you go to relax? Is there a local watering <laughs> hole? Is there a park that you just go away, sit down, relax, and let just decompress for a few hours before you have to start back up the next day? Yeah. Um, nice thing is we've got two local breweries in town, uh, New Ontario and Gateway. And Gateway is actually on my way home from work. 
Um, so <laughs> very convenient. Uh, and they also always have a great atmosphere. Uh, tonight, they actually have a community choir, which is completely, you know, you don't have to be a professional. You can show up. We, you know, can sing any song. Uh, the one time I went most recently, we did Shania Twain. Um, and they teach you in that moment how to sing the song. And then it's just like a great, a great, uh, great vibes and great uh, place to be. And then where my home is, I'm a five minute walk from that waterfront. And then there's trails and walkways that go all along the waterfront. And so one of my favorite things to do after a long day or a long council meeting when I need to decompress is going and walking down to the waterfront and catching the sunset um, and walking along the, the waterfront path and then looping back home. And by the time I get home, it uh, usually really helps kind of get me back into a good, good head space. Well, you've painted a picture that I want to go take that walk now. So I'm, I, that's <laughs> on the bucket list as well. We'll add that to the list too. Perfect. Exactly. So I want to end with this question. And this is the most important question I've asked the, this entire 45 minutes. And you can take as long as you want to answer this or as short as time you want to answer this. In your okay. opinion, what makes the city of North Bay such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Hmm. You know... It's a great question. I uh, I will admit I tried to leave North Bay a number of times after I finished high school, but then I decided to stay and go to university. And then I decided, you know, well, after university, I'm going to leave and try a different place. Got a job right away and said, okay, fine, I'll do this contract job and then I'll leave. And then by that time it was like, wait a second, why am I leaving? What am I leaving for? What do I think is going to be different? And what really makes North Bay such a special place to live, to work, and to be. Um, and it's funny because you say raise a family and I'm actually expecting my first uh, child this summer. So, you know, I'm really putting this into perspective of like why this is where I want to raise my family now too is. Congratulations. Of- Can I just say that right away? <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to interrupt. Congratulations. Like, <laughs> Thank wow. <you. laughs> Yeah, wasn't busy enough already being on council for first term. I decided to, you know, put this on top as well, too. Lots of time. Um, it's North Bay is one of those, when I say 15 minute cities, you can pretty much drive anywhere in North Bay in 15 minutes or so. Um, you know, there is a bit of rush hours here and there, but if you want to get from one end of the town to the other, or the city, I should say, um, it doesn't take you hours or even that long and so everything's within proximity everyone's really friendly uh you know people recognize you they smile they say hi when you're going for a walk and we look out for each other here as well Uh, that balance of nature and then also having all the amenities so we're you know we're not a big city type of feeling you know sometimes when you're leaving our uh, North Bay Battalion is are, is in the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, and so when you leave that game and there's 4,000, over 4,000 people exiting that building, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, like this is a big city feeling. But then you get in your car and you drive home and you're like, oh, you know, like that nice pace. And so there's a really great balance of having things to do being, you know, still close to those lar- larger urban centers if you're looking for a very specific store, but we have all the amenities here. There's a ski hill in the middle of the city. We've got two beautiful lakes, um, lots of public beach access. My husband's actually from Huntsville, and I, it didn't take me much to convince him, you know, that North Bay was where we wanted to settle and to live because, you know, he's an outdoorsy person, but he also you know, saw the the different aspects of the city for opportunity. Uh, and he was able to get a job really quickly. And we were able to find a home and just put our roots down and get to know our neighbors. And um, we play a game called North Bay Bingo, where you might not know someone directly, but you can kind of do a couple dots and either 
you know, especially if you've grown up here, it's like, oh, your grandmother was so-and-so, or, oh, you went to high school with this person, or you work with this person, or your kids go to daycare together. There's that degree separation isn't too close, but it's still close enough that you can connect people together. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's got all the things you want of a big city without it being that hustle bustle busyness and all that value of a small community without being too small. Maggie, I want to thank you. This <laughs> you moving here now? <laughs> uh, I, I, if you can convince my husband, I will move there tomorrow. But I, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me. Um, I followed your career since you were first elected, and I, I, I am so happy that we got the chance to sit down. Uh, yeah. I, I say this to some councillors and mayors, but I want to say this to you. North Bay's lucky to have you. You seem like you, you are in it for the right reasons and we need more people like you on council. So thank you so much for stepping up, serving and doing what you do. And congratulations on the first uh, baby here in the summer. Yeah. And hopefully either I will get to meet it or <laughs> I will get to see the pre moments right before that. And I heard yes, Chris exactly. is a really good name both ways as a male and female from what my parents have oh, told yes. me. You know what? We actually, there's a counselor on city council and his name is Chris. And he has also generously uh, shared that his name is available too. And for those exact same reasons, it's a very flexible name. So I will make sure I keep it uh, as an option. Exactly. But no, thank you. You know, I've been following uh, your podcasts and your interviews as well and listening into them. And I really appreciate, you know, the the spotlight you get to put on you know, municipal elected leaders who might not be from the big or urban centers and just how our journeys are so similar, but then we also have that feedback we can share with each other too. So thank you. Um, so with that, I want to remind everyone, yeah. put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and God forbid, it actually makes us better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border <laughs> Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, just keep talking. Thank you.